Good evening, everyone, and welcome to your Wednesday evening corporate worship service where we get to worship the Lord together. I hope you worship the Lord during the week in your own spot, in your own space. Um, but here's a time where we get to corporately come together. We welcome everyone who's joining us online. And so we are, we are one church in multiple locations, amen? Because we're not all right here physically in this building, right? We're all over, the, all over the counties, surrounding counties, and we're all over the state. We're all in different states joining us and even in different countries. Uh, so we welcome everyone to our service tonight. And I just want to open with a beautiful passage out of Zephaniah 317. And it goes like this, the Lord your God is with you. This is 317, the mighty warrior who saves. Now let's just stop right there. So first of all, he said he's with us. Anybody been feeling a little bit alone lately? Our feelings can lie to us, right? Because the Lord is with us. He is in our midst, the mighty warrior who saves. Now how many of you would say by either a raise of your hand or a little wave emoji would say, all right, we're needing some mighty warriors in the midst of our circumstances. There's places where the enemy's trying to take jurisdiction and we need them kicked out. <laughs> we need circumstances to bow to a mighty warrior, right? The enemy is a trespasser. So he's the mighty warrior who not just, not just like, hey, I'm good, I got muscles. No, he saves, he does something. He saves, it says. He will take great delight in you. No, look, that's a whole nother thought right there. Take great delight in you. Wow, that means, the, that means the creator of the universe, y'all, he created billions and billions of stars that are millions of times bigger than anything we've ever set our eyes on, right? He takes delight in you, in me, that's amazing. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Now I'll say some versions actually say loud singing, <laughs> loud singing. Have you ever been around somebody who's singing at the top of their lungs? <laughs> right? That's done on purpose, right? You got some confidence. You got a reason you're singing when you do it with loud singing. So here's, a, I love that, that the Lord will no longer rebuke you. So that means that we come to him in, with contrition. When we come to him and we, we say, God, forgive me. I have been a sinner. Well, Jesus' blood covers that, washes it, makes it as if it had never existed. And then God's response is, Woo! I can love you all through and through. I can love you so much, I'm going to sing at the top of my lungs about it. Can you all imagine, like, you know, the whole Romeo and Juliet thing? There's Romeo, you know, singing from down there. And he's loving you so much, he's got to sing at the top of his lungs. Tell everybody, y'all, when, when Pastor Jimmy and I were just dating, <laughs> Pastor Jimmy would do crazy things like that. He'd do things out in public. I'd be like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe him. But why? Because he was wanting to show and tell the world that he had somebody special, and it made me feel just very loved. Well, let me tell you, God is here right now in our midst, like I said in the beginning of that, and he rejoices over you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what circumstances, no matter what lies the enemy's been trying to tell you, he's rejoicing over you with singing tonight. So I tell you what my response is going to be. I'm going to sing loudly under him. I'm going to rejoice in him. So why don't you stand to your feet and join me? As we just celebrate God's love for us, we celebrate his goodness to us. Father, we acknowledge that you are amazing, you are great, you are mighty, you are full of love and compassion, and your mercies are new every morning. And we thank you, Father, that your love extends wherever we've been and wherever we are. And so we celebrate you tonight, and we want to let it out and sing loudly unto you tonight. Woo!
shout. Oh, we praise you. We worship you. You are great and wonderful and mighty and so good to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus.
Come on, tell him. He has to live. I'll just sing it one more time as Pastor comes, Jesus. Jesus, what is the lamb that was slain for us? Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great. Praise the Lord. Amen. The flood didn't drown you. The rain didn't keep you away. You still found your way to the house of God. Thank you for being here. Why don't you turn around and wave at everybody and look at Andy and Kim and say, Welcome, looking forward to the shower tomorrow evening or th Friday evening excuse me amen did you wave at somebody they're going to thank your standoffish and selfish if you didn't you can be seated 
Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, this is an exciting week. Exciting. Friday night we're going to be having a wonderful bridal shower for Alan and Natalie. And uh, I'm still excited over Rory. Y'all know who Rory is? That's my great-granddaughter and Steve and Tara. And um, I'm very excited. And Brandon's coming tomorrow to visit me so he can go spend time with the baby. And tonight, you know where Carrie is, right? She is at the hospital. And so we're just going to pray for a a good delivery and a healthy baby and um, and for Mitch to be able to um, get not too crazy. <laughs> Amen. I'm just thankful for all the Lord is doing for us and so appreciative of you being here with us tonight. As we're praying, we want to remember Katie. Uh, she had some difficulties yesterday, um, but she's still, she's in the fight. She's in the ring. <laughs> she's pushing on. So I want to encourage you to keep praying for her. And you know, many times at the beginning of a situation, there's a great push, and there needs to be because there's so many immediate decisions, so many immediate things that have to be taken care of, uh, but continue in prayer for her. It's not just a one prayer and done. Sometimes you have to wait before the Lord. You need to continue in prayer. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I appreciate it so very much. God bless you as they come to give, for you to give tonight. Thank you so much. Father, I thank you for your provision. I thank you, God, for meeting the needs of your people. I pray, Father, for those who have businesses, that you will give them wisdom and discernment to know and discern the times. Father, for those who have a need, I ask you to meet it. And Lord, for those that need your strength even for this day. I pray your peace and your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you. If you're visiting with us tonight, thank you. I appreciate you being here and being a part of our services. Thank you so very much. I certainly enjoy listening to Brother Eddie Pruitt Sunday night. Uh, when he got through, I said, oh, my, he's ruined preaching around here for quite a while now. I said, we got to preach behind all of that. But it really was awesome. I enjoyed him so very much. It was precious, a very timely word, and a word that was well received. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want to began uh, reading in Matthew chapter 17. I have chapter, I have Luke, uh, Sherry, but it's a mistake that I made. It's Matthew chapter 17. So I want to start in Matthew chapter 17. 
I want to take you uh, for just a few moments as a background to the message tonight. Uh, you know Luke chapter 4. You know, that, you know what Luke chapter 4 is. Uh, that's when Jesus takes the book of Isaiah and reads the prophetic word of God and makes application to himself. And he talks about the anointed and how, how God has called him. And immediately after that, you will find that the people of Nazareth were filled with wrath. They were filled with wrath. And you'll find that in Acts chapter 4. And um, you know what really set them off? What really set them off was that he had the audacity to read those scriptures, of course, and apply them to himself. But also he alludes to two Gentiles while he's talking about his anointing, while he's called what, he is, what God has brought him forth to do. He talks about two Gentiles, two Gentiles. And uh, it infuriated them. And so I want to visit that with you a little bit tonight. So turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 16. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And there he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Verse 3 is where I want to take you for a few minutes. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. I want to just for a few minutes talk to you about some of those likenesses between Moses and Elijah. Father, let the Word of God be quick and powerful. Let it have anointing in life, and may it profit, and may it be an encouragement and a strengthening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Moses and Elijah, they were a lot alike and shared some, some very, what I would call, mutual experiences. And I want to visit those for you in just a moment. In, in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 15 and 1 Kings chapter 17 and 26, you will see like Moses, Elijah had to flee from a wrathful king. Both had to flee for their lives. And uh, Moses, of course, fled from Pharaoh. And, um, and Elijah fled from Jezebel and Ahab. So they both knew what it was to have to leave the premises in a hurry, to leave with people wanting to kill you. Can you imagine living knowing somebody wanted to kill you? As sweet as you are, as delightful as you are, as blessed as we are to have you, uh, may I say, they wanted, I can't even imagine that kind of energy, can you? That kind of negativity. I mean, I understand we can have personality clashes. I understand we can have strong differences of opinion. But want to murder somebody? Want to murder somebody? And may I tell you that John the Baptist faced the same dilemma. He faced the same dilemma. So both of these men knew what it was like to flee, knew what it was like to have someone desire to kill them. Moses challenges Pharaoh. Elijah challenges Ahab. You'll find that in Exodus chapter 16 and 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2 through 6. Moses and Elijah express both experience God's bread provision of bread, God's provision of meat. You remember the quail? You remember the ravens? You remember that? And water. They both had supernatural provision of bread and of meat and of water. 
So they both knew what it was like to depend on God, to trust God, to have God provide for them. When you got somebody that hates you and you have to go into hiding or seclusion, you have to have a provision. You have to have someone that's going to be there for you and minister to you. Uh, I want you to notice that each one, that Moses and Elijah both go up to Mount Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights to appear before God, to appear before God. Both of them, both of them had to have reassurances of their missions. Uh, may I say this to you, both of these men could be um, very passionate. Uh, could even be volatile with their anger. While Moses is called the meekest of men, that means he was easily led by God. It means a sensitivity to the reins of the Holy Spirit in your life. And Elijah, both of them, both of them needed the encouragement of God. Uh, both of them at times felt that it was way way beyond anything that they could ever take care of. Both of them, both of them are prophets, are prophets of God, and both of them are involved intricately in the prophetic word in the life of Jesus. Now I want to show you someone else that Elijah is particularly near to or is a do you remember what our brother James said, speaking about Elijah, speaking about the subject of prayer? Do you remember what Elijah was a man subject to like passions? That includes his personality type, if you're interested in that. Both of them could have some moments of, uh, what shall I call them, some melancholy moments. Some moments where they where they needed encouragement and strengthening and, and help. And both of those men, James put it this way. James said, subject to like passions. That not only means our passions for, for what we do or are called to, but it also speaks of our personalities and and both, all of these men were fierce for righteousness. All of these men had their lives threatened. All of these, you know, it's interesting to me that a queen threatened, her name was Herodias, threatened the life of John the Baptist. Well, another one named Jezebel said, boy, when you get them out here, you're in trouble. Another one named Jezebel. Isn't that interesting? Two women, both of them, say that they are going to take them out. Jezebel said, if he's still alive by tomorrow, I'll kill him. Herodias planned and schemed until she took out John the Baptist. I'm just showing you the similarities between these three men. Now go with me, please, to Luke chapter 4. And I want to read the verse that I spoke to you about earlier, Luke chapter 4, and verse 25. Verse 24, he says, Verily I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, where the heaven was shut up. Three years and six months, when a great famine was throughout all the land. One thing you need to understand immediately when you read that is first, of course, that she is a widow, a widow, but second, that she is a Gentile. She is a Gentile. Please watch the verse that follows it. You'll see that, but unto. Uh, none of them was Elijah sent, save Serapita, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. She is a Gentile. Take it to verse 27 for me. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet. 
and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman. Jesus pulls two stories to speak of their rejection of him. Both of these stories or miracles happened for Gentiles. Naaman was a Syrian. The widow is from Sadar. They are both Gentiles. Watch the response that he gets. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down to the down headlong. They wanted to kill him. After these powerful verses, listen to what he did. He opened the book. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight, sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister, and, and sat down, and all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He had read from Isaiah 61. And all bore witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Wrong! Wrong! Joseph was a stepfather to Jesus. He was important in Jesus' life, especially in those early months when, when Jesus' life was so threatened. But I want you to understand, when you look at Jesus at, as Joseph's son, you have missed the mark. You have missed the mark. Jesus is the Son of God. Our Heavenly Father is His Father. And, and they said, is not this Joseph? So they talk about his gracious words, and, and, and they attribute it as Joseph's son. And he said to them, you will surely say to me, this proverb, heal, your, heal yourself whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum. Do also in here in your country. They wanted to see what he had done in other places. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And then he gives those two stories, the story of the widow of Zarephath and the story of Naaman, and a rage comes inside of them. You know, they had absolutely no interest in missionary evangelism, none at all. Jonah portrays most of the people's attitude of that day towards a foreign nation. Let them die. Let them perish. But I want you to know Jesus came for the whole world. He didn't. He came and he came to Israel. He came into his own and his own did what? His own refused him. They rejected him. And their rejection of Jesus has become our opportunity in this age of the Gentiles that where they fell out and lost, we have received because they turned away from their benefit. So their turning away, their unbelief, their rejection has become an opportunity that you and I are enjoying this beautiful and wonderful salvation. I cannot say that I'm glad that they rejected him, but I'm glad that the Gentiles were included for he said, For God so loved the world... But they weren't interested in the world. They were interested in their nation. I appreciate that, respect that, but I want you to know they, 
They didn't want a revival somewhere else. They weren't interested in a revival over in Sidon. They weren't interested in a revival where Naaman was at. What they were interested in was what was their delight and their choices. Go with me now, please. I know you can keep all these discussions together. Just go to the beauty shop. They can carry on five discussions at one time, and every lady can listen to all five of them and never lose her train of thought. When the men talk, we all talk to one another, or we all talk to the group. But we wouldn't dare try to listen to five conversations at one time. Some of us are easily confused. Maybe not you, but me. Go with me now to 1 Kings chapter chapter uh, 17. I want to read to you out of this great story that they were they so rejected and were so so adamant and so angry about. It's in chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to it, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Get yourself from here and turn you eastward and hide yourself, hide yourself, hide yourself. I know that doesn't sound bold and fearless, but I'm going to tell you when you've spoken, when you said it's not going to rain, but at my word, when you've taken such a bold stand, made a declaration that's going to affect everybody's income, affect the very sustaining of your nation, people are going to listen. People are going to listen, especially the king is going to listen. I pray that we become so anointed, that we become so powerful in the spirit, that like as when Jesus spoke even to his own hometown. You know, we like to put up the, the signs, this is the home of, this is the home of. And we like to note where famous people was born. But I'm going to tell you, Nazareth wanted nothing to do with him. First, I want to tell you that your home roots sometime, when you come back with an anointing, with a power, with a voice, with a message, you see that I never want you to rise above their expectation of you. Hello? They want you to remain. I've seen some folks that didn't want their loved ones to be delivered because they didn't want to deal with a new person. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Your hometown wants you to remain in their frame of reference, how they picture you, what they think. You. Have you ever read those high school annuals when they do those prophetic projections about what the student is going to become. Y'all remember that? Y'all didn't have that? How many of you know what I, what you, how many of you can remember what they said about you? I'm telling you. Does anybody remember? Oh, y'all pleasantly forgot that, right? Pleasantly forgot that. Well, I tell you what they said about me. They were literally making, I won't call it making fun. I'll just say having fun. And mine was John Chase buys Go-Go Club in Florida. And they were literally, literally making fun, having a good time at my expense. But I want to tell you something, folks. A lot of people don't want you to rise above their expectation of you, how they categorize you, how they, how they, he's going to be just like, hello, he's going to be just like, well, I'm going to tell you, Elijah wasn't just like anybody, and Jesus, whoo, the God man certainly wasn't like anybody, and Moses, I'm telling you such Power, such anointing 
flow through these men's lives. And I want to say to you, the first place of rejection when you preach that message that God gives you about Jesus Christ, the confrontation may come from those whom you had hoped to receive the most encouragement from. The most encouragement. Read with me in verse 5. Read with me. I need to read for you in verse 3. Get you from here, return you eastward, and hide by the brook that is before Jordan, and it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and watch this, and I have commanded. I want you to know when you are in the will of God, when you're preaching his word with power, when your life, when your life is being examined and criticized, I want you to know he has a hiding place for you. I want you to know he has a rescue place for you. I'm telling you, you may not think so, but there is a cloud that's on the horizon that is filled with opposition that has no regard, no respect. I'm going to tell you they have about as much respect for your Christianity as those memorials that have been disposed of and thrown in the street. And don't you think that the cross won't come before their eyes on some occasions? And don't you think that your testimony that is quick, that is powerful, that is anointed, that causes them emotional distress. I'm going to tell you, you really don't know how unpopular you are yet. I'm trying to tell you before it gets here, and I'm trying to tell you that the tide has turned and the anger and the opposition to God's testimony is growing. But he said, I have commanded the ravens to feed you. Sometimes you need a a hiding place. And when you're there, you're going to need something to sustain you, both spiritually and physically. Some of you need a hiding place. You've You've been through some storms. You've been through some oppositions. You've been through some disappointments. You've been through some promises that failed and trust that have been broken. But I'm going to tell you, God has a hiding place for you. God has a hiding place for you. It's a place shut in by the Spirit of God, a refuge for you because God knows the attack that you are under. I'm glad he hid the men. I'm glad that he made a provision. I want you to notice who he, who he commands. Well, it wouldn't be who we would have chosen. I mean, he chose the Raven Restaurant. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're eating off the Raven's menu. You're, you're eating carrion. You're eating what's left beside the road. I didn't say Elijah had to eat that. I said that's what those ravens feed on. God can provide for you by simply a command. Mm. Mm. You know, God knows the anger. God knows the frustration. God knows the disappointment. God knows the opposition that will rise in our life at one call or one day. So he went and did. Say that with me. He went and did. He went and did. That go ye is always a part of it, isn't it? He went and he did. He went and he did. I'm so thankful that he did. According to the word of God. For he went and dwelled by the brook of Cherith, that is before Jordan's. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank to the brook. And it came to a pass after a while. Say transition with me. After a while, that means a change. That means a transition. That means what you counted on has changed. 
know that bothers people? That bothers people. When the river, when the brook dries up, wow, when your source changes, when what you counted on changes. But I want you to know that God is directing your life. God is going to keep your life. God is going to be your provider. Your provider. After a while, after a while, I don't know how long after a while was, but I think it was probably a few months. He got used to his own time deliveries. He got used to the menu, and he was appreciative and thankful. But sometimes when you least likely think so, God will stir your nest. God will cause your brook to dry up because he knows the comfort that we have in receiving a scheduled meal every day. There's a lot of people like to have that. Like to have a scheduled meal at every. I, I, it is in my mind that he spent a lot of time in fasting and prayer. Wouldn't you if you were in hiding? Wouldn't you if God, you know, when God has to hide you and God has to feed you, that's some pretty serious, pretty serious situation. But folks, I'm telling you, God is raising up a generation with a backbone. He's calling together a people who will stand for righteousness, who will be unafraid. And when they speak, God will honor what they speak, and men will fear them while they hate them. While they hate them. If you think that people are delighted by powerful people, preaching and the anointing of the word that brings conviction, that calls for repentance, that means a separated, sanctified life. Hello, y'all. I hope y'all can add all those things up. I hope you can add all those things up. As long as you preach something that tickles their ears, as long as you te preach something where they don't have to change the menu, as long as you will live in the boundaries of where they are. But you are in the last days, like it or not. You are here. <laughs> Do you know our forefathers in Pentecost suffered great persecution? My pastor was stabbed behind the ear for preaching a message of righteousness. I have met people who had eggs thrown at them, and I'm not talking about the fresh ones either. Anybody ever smelt a rotten egg? Let me see your hand. You know what? A, well, if you haven't, you haven't missed anything. But you've missed something you will not forget if you ever smell it. We came up, folks, we came up. Pentecost did. We came up on a little street in, in Los Angeles. Our churches for many years had to struggle. We had to overcome stigmatisms. We had to overcome the doctrinal differences that people found between us and them. But I'll tell you, they were strong. They lived the godly life. They were uncompromising in their convictions, whether you believe the conviction or not. They were frequently in prolonged prayer meetings, often falling prostrate under the power of God and laying for hours as the Spirit of God called them. I'm telling you, I believe there's going to come a move of prayer very quickly. I don't mean months and months later, but I believe I see it up on the horizon now where people are going to find places of prayer, where people are going to make prayer more than a five-minute good morning, Lord, and a five-minute good night, Lord. I, oh, Jesus. I believe it's going to be pro protracted. I believe it's going to be groaning. I believe it's going to be deep. More than a give me list. I believe it's going to be deep intercession. 
for our world, for our nation, for our church. How easy we pass over words. How quickly we count them as nothing. But I'm telling you, I hear the sound of a prayer meeting in my heart, calling out for family, calling out for loved ones, calling out for our nation, calling out for the mercies of God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Go with me to chapter 17 again. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evenings, and drink of the brook. And it came to pass after a while. After a while, the brook dried up. And it came to pass because there had been no rain in the land. Why had there been no rain? Blame it on the church. That's what's happening now. It's what's going to happen in the future. Blame it on the church. And in particular, that praying bunch, that prophesying family. I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you more plain because I don't want to be any failure in communications. Around the curve, the next bend, and over the hill, over the hill. Nobody won't have to ask you to pray. Nobody won't have to beg you to pray. A gathering of prayer will become the most important meeting in this area. They have come for miracles. They have come for signs and wonders. They have come for manifestations and gifts of the Spirit. But I see a move of God around the bend where the prayer meeting, somebody say prayer meeting, the prayer meeting, the prayer meeting, the least popular. I can pack hundreds in here to get the right person to sing. You can pack hundreds in here to hear what they want to hear. But I'm telling you, I hear the sound of prayer. I always had hoped that the move would come with great joy. But I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you, when you come out of persecution, you'll have great joy. When he lifts you up out of your suffering, you'll have great joy. Joy comes in the morning. I hear a night of prayer. We're not going to embarrass ourselves by asking how long we pray each day or even if we do pray. I do not know how many preachers I've been around in my lifetime. A lot of them wanted to take me to a restaurant, and so I joined them. A lot of them wanted to take me golfing, and so I joined them. But I'm going to tell you, there's only been one handful that ever said, will you fast and pray with me this week? Will you, will you meet me at the altar tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock? One of the greatest churches in our nation. And certainly our Assemblies of God had a prayer morning every morning at 6 o'clock. Well, I didn't sign up for that when I went to preach the revival. I mean, the evangelist is supposed to do a lot of things when he comes. But, you know, after you preach like I do, especially two services on a Sunday, Monday morning at 6 o'clock don't look pretty. Hello? I might not look pretty any day to the week at 6 o'clock in the morning. Hello? Oh, oh, as we're going out the door, the pastor said, this is Jerome, and Jerome will pick you up at your motel at 530. Jesus, oh, Jesus. Robert Perdue, who's passed away now, great, great man of God for years, every morning of his life, no matter where he was, he prayed an hour every morning. 
Dr. Thomas Trask, our general superintendent, for many years, pastor of the great Brightmore Tabernacle Church, became treasurer of the Assemblies of God, then became our general superintendent. Every morning, whether he was in Hong Kong or China or Australia, no matter what the time change was at 6 o'clock, that man would be in prayer. I never heard him preach that he didn't call for revival. I never heard him preach that he wasn't hungry for a move of God and a move of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, if you are prayerless, you are powerless. When you pray, creativity flows like a river. When you pray, anointed ideas that you never would have imagined come to you. Everything that God does in our life, he first does it in prayer. I've stayed in places that were so scary praying most of the night. We had no trouble. Because when I woke up, I said, oh, God, I've never been in a place like this place before. Oh, I can tell you what nights of, of sleeplessness and prayer, the anointing moves and the Holy Ghost falls and there's, there's a richness and a deepness that's beyond your physical capability. You say, oh, God, visit me in the night. Visit me in the night. Oh, some of you going to have, some of you going to, Oh, do you remember the, the war room? Do y'all not even know what I'm talking about? The war room? How many of you know what the war room is? That little lady getting in that room and writing those names. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 When you're more hungry. For the prayer meeting and the finger foods. When the aroma of prayer is more fragrant. Whew. And the fried chicken. Oh, Lord, somebody has bought me some food tonight. That's a wonderful, rich, glorious smell of garlic. Hallelujah. I can tell some of y'all just ain't interested in that at all. But I like savory foods. Oh, folks. Oh, folks. When we come into the house of God and the time of prayer happens, every voice will be lifted. Every head will be bowed. There'll be no looking around to check out others wear others, how do others expression. May it be so intense that time loses its relevance. If we pray through, the message will be powerful, meaningful, and life-changing. Don't you like to be on the leading edge? Don't you like to be ahead of the curve? I want to tell you, there's coming a season of prayer, a time and place of prayer that God could awaken us, that God could empower us. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, COVID has proved to the church, to many churches, how weak we were. It's proved to many churches how weak in prayer we were, how weak we were in loving one another, how weak we were in caring about one another. Oh, I hear the prayer bells of heaven. Oh, how sweetly they ring. Bearing a message unto Jesus 
but he you hearing me you hearing me you hearing me when the holy spirit nudges you early in the morning you'll slide out not with grumblings not but with regret but what's going on god god where's my child god where's my family member we won't be rushing at the schedule. Oh, Jesus. I know we want to get it other ways. I know we do. I know we do. We like to, we like to bring in a house of fire preacher who can pray it all down for us. But it'll leave town with him, too. Won't last with him. Won't last with him. Hear me. It's late. It's high time. You know why I haven't died? And bought some rest to some folks' ears. Gone on to the other side of, of glory. Because God called me to these last days. And I'm telling you, it's a time of prayer. No rain in the land. Verse 8 for me, please. Let me let me move on. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, folks, when that's not happening, we have no direction. Hello. Hello. It's not what the popular trend is. What's acceptable? to the financial institutions. I'm hearing rumbling underneath. You better listen to me. I hear rumbling underneath that financial world. Money has been poured out like water with total disregard. We need your ear. You need your ear up beside heaven's heartbeat. You need to hear from God. You think E.F. Hutton has got something to say? I'm telling you, you are entering into, entering into, don't you, aren't you alert? And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, uh, they'd much rather lead, read Wall Street. They'd much rather lead, read their favorite newscaster. I'm going to tell you something. God is the only forecaster who can tell you what your tomorrow holds and what your future is. Yes, I delight and thrill. When people bring you a personal word that is so right on. But I tell you, it's even more thrilling when you're on your knees and the Holy Spirit blows in and he whispers. You know, I preached to you about Noah in a reprobate world. What do you mean reprobate? When there ain't but eight, seven, eight people. Save me and the reprobate. I don't care how good they were at entertainment. I don't care how good they were at their sports program. I don't care how good they were at any of them. They had rejected God. They were living a life acceptable to the community but not acceptable to God. You can't fathom that. Only eight people in the world are not subjecting demon spirits and perverted lifestyles 
the wicked, oh, it won't happen here. Oh, it don't take long. It just takes them off the ark. Even before you can get off the ark, that spirit came over on the ark. Let me tell you something, folks. You need to have an anointing. So when that serpent comes across your yard, he makes an exit. Do you know in the last month some of you have been have been faced with what could have been disastrous situations? I mean, if God had not intervened when he did, we would have had to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars. But God intervened. Hallelujah. You know, T.D. Jake said, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And I know he was saying getting ready for a blessing. I'm saying getting ready for a prayer meeting. Don't shine it. Don't file it under unnecessary. Woohoo! God's power of prayer flowing through your lives. One of the most powerful visitations in my life. I do not know how many weeks it had been. I just know that morning that it happened. Brenda reached over as I was trying to get out of bed and said, can't you rest today? Can't you rest today? Can't you rest today? I wanted to. I wanted to for her sake. I didn't want her to put, go through what I was going through. I didn't want her worried about my health. I didn't want her worried about me breaking down with a nervous breakdown. In compassion, she reached over and said to me, can't you just rest today? I said, I, I got to go. I lived in a village where they went to church barefooted on occasion. You know, that just was their lifestyle. When I've had my ushers take it up and offer it in their bare feet. But that's, that, was, that was their lifestyle. That was the way, the way they lived. So I got up that morning and I made my way over to church. It was a little before six. And you don't have many folks come help you that time of day. I was laying off the platform, laying on the platform with my feet hanging off the platform. I don't know how long I'd been in prayer when I felt somebody take my feet. Hallelujah. And I heard a voice playing. Vietnam, Purple Heart, Vietnam Distinguished Awards, and he was praying. You see, when you're praying, provoke somebody else's prayer. You know, things get through a community about what a church does and doesn't do. You know that? And folks in the community had heard and had started calling my deacons and said, you you got you to gotta do something for your pastor. He's going, off the, he's going off the deep end. I wish some of us could find the deep end. And one of my deacons, he had my feet in his hands and he was weeping and his tears were running on my bare feet. And I turned to say to him, please don't do that. I just, it, it just was so humbling. I, I, didn't, I didn't respond right, maybe, but I didn't know what to say. I said, don't do that. And when I did, I saw the form of a dove come right through the wall. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it hover above him as he wept and prayed in a beautiful language in the Holy Ghost. And living strength flowed into my body. Yeah. 
I think I need to bring him here and let him tell the story because some of you look at me like you you just fell off a tree somewhere. He was not my especially favorite board member. He wasn't my especially favorite person. But when I needed somebody to go to battle, he understood it. He understood it. Oh, folks, I'm not talking about Romper room religion. Say, what do you mean? I'm talking about acting like children when we should be grown men and women. When we should be off the bottle, on to the meat. I want to tell you, you know, you know, people talk a lot about food. I do. I do. But are we talking about that spiritual food? What menu do you have? What menu? I'm 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 moving towards a close. Ah, I hope you've heard my heart. I've tried to tell you what is coming. You know when most people are most apt to pray? When trouble and pressures bring them to their knees. You might not have prayed at all this week, but I guarantee you one thing, something could happen, but for the mercies of God, that you, you will weep your way through this night. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. You know not what a day may bring. I want to tell you, you're going to learn to say as the Lord wills. The word of the Lord came unto him. The word of the Lord came unto him. The word of the Lord came unto him. Now I want you to watch this. Saying, get you to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Gentiles, 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 going where you're not welcome and you don't want to go. That's what's coming. We're going to go where we've been unwanted, but we're going to go where it takes to follow the command of the Lord Somebody asked me after hearing Brandon saying, oh, how does it feel? What does it feel like for your son to sell everything he's got in, in the States and go to, go to Mexico? And I've been in some of those places. And Brandon goes to the worst of them. He goes to the ugliest of them. He goes to the places where the demons cry out at you. What do you think about him taking your grandbaby? Your grandson? You know, couldn't he stay here another two years and, and let them? Let me tell you something, folks. Time is fleeing so fastly, and the will of God has become so timely demanding. <sighs> Don't say three days and let me kiss mama bye. <sighs> but I'm going to tell you, people are going to walk in a power. In a joy, in a joy. Who say, how are you going to have joy with all them prayer meetings and, and all that opposition? Because that's where real joy comes from. Take it to the next verse for me. Did you, did you, notice, did you notice that she is a Gentile? But God can speak to a Gentile. Do you get that? You know why he's speaking to her? He couldn't find nobody in Israel. 
who probably wouldn't have turned him in. Folks, you, you don't understand the power that's just in that word. He, he spoke to a widow in Zarephath. I want to tell you what, God has got people planted in places you have absolutely no idea. I've seen them show up at service stations. I've seen them come to prayer meetings. I've read of them standing beside the road waiting for a certain person. Those who have been commanded by God and moving in the power of the Spirit. I know your world is comfortable. I know it's predictable. But I believe it's coming soon that we're going to step out. You say, oh, preacher, there's risk in that. There's risk in going from here to the store. There's risk from COVID. There's risk from cancer. There's not a day you go by. There's not some risk in your life that the Holy Spirit covers and you walk right on through and are not even aware that he has been there before you. I'm, I'm going to close in just a minute. Maybe it's not going to be a skinny minute now. I know you were hoping for a skinny minute. I have commanded a widow woman to sustain. That's more than cookie or meal. That's sustain. I wonder how he spoke to her. I wonder what religious background she had. I tell you one thing. I know what God was looking for when he found her that he couldn't find in Israel. Do you know how low the faith was in Israel? That it was a woman of Zareph. That was a woman, a Grecian woman that came from Syrophoenicia. Had to go that far to find a woman that would say, let me eat the crumbs from a master table. It wasn't happening in Jerusalem. It wasn't happening in Israel. I know why it's from Zarephath, because they had to find somebody with faith. Do you hear that? Do you hear me? God does nothing but by faith. A lot of faith talkers, not many faith walkers. What do you mean walk? Enoch walked. Abraham walked. Noah walked. Brother West, would you please be kind to me and come and play something softly on the on the piano? I, I want you to get this. Why did God choose her? I believe because she had faith. I want to say that to you again. She had faith. God's going to do nothing in your life that's going to change anybody's world unless faith. You can't be saved without it. And I believe God found faith. He had to go that far. You know who, what, who Naaman was? He was an Assyrian. Now, that is a first-class enemy of Israel. You know what kind of faith he had? He had the faith that believed the testimony of a little girl. I went to God. That name it was in his room for, for there is a man of God. I want you to watch. I'm, all, I'm almost through, and I've labored long, and you've been patient.
Verse 9. Arise, get you down to Zarephath. That is transition. That is movement. He has served his place, his reason for being by the brook. Listen. And he went, he arose and went to Zarephath, and there he came to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow woman was gathering sticks. He called to her, bring me, I pray you, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. I don't care how great a preacher you are, how great a Christian you are, you need the support of other people. And sometimes it's staggering as to where they come from. I wouldn't have chosen a widow woman. Why put anybody out? You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, meager. 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 I'd rather have a handful of bread and the power and the anointing of God than the feast at the table of the kings and of riches. Do you hear me? Fetch me, I pray. All right, I want you to watch the progression of faith. If you're ever evangelizing, if you're ever working door to door, if you're ever invited in somebody's home and they're unbelievable, ask them for a glass of water. Because you just did for them the most powerful thing and gave them the most powerful opportunity they could ever have because whosoever gives a cup of water He said, fetch me some water. You know, water's been in short supply. Right? Three years, no rain. Short supply. You know what she did? I, 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 I would like to know how God communicated to her. Because God said, I have commanded her. I tell you, God will command some things for you. For you, command for you. He commanded that widow, and you said, "Well, I was hoping for something higher up, you know, like a lawyer or a banker or a general or somebody, a widow, a widow, a widow, who was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, fetch me." I pray thee a little water in a vessel that I may drink. That's pretty humbling. That's pretty humbling. That's pretty humbling. But it was pretty humbling for Jesus to leave all that ever it is to come to us. Pretty humbling for him to be spit on, mocked, stripped naked, and beat. Pretty humbling. Pretty humbling. I want you to notice he gave her an assignment. I think he was just assuring himself that he had come to the right place. Because if she wasn't going to give him a, water, a drink of water, she sure wasn't going to feed him and take care of him. Verse 11. Verse 11. And as, as she was going to fetch him, as she was, did you read that? He saw her faith in action. He was emboldened in the spirit. And he said, he called to her and said, hey, hey, ma'am, bring me, I pray thee, not a loaf of bread, a morsel. He wanted her faith activated because he knew where the supply was coming from and he knew that the supplier could feed him manna should he choose to. I'm going to tell you that's where we're going to be. The want and wish list 
is going to decrease. And the list that says, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. A morsel of bread in thine hand. You see the personal involvement there in thine hand? You see the personal involvement? Bring me a morsel. I don't know where in the world he thought she's going to get a morsel of bread from. Watch what she, I want you to know something about this lady. She has faith, but she is a realist. She is a realist. She knows what the supply line is. Verse 12 for me. And she said as the Lord, whoa, she knows something. She knew who his God was. There's somebody that knows your story. There's somebody that knows your need. There's somebody that has you in their prayers. And As thy God liveth. Folks, I don't know how God spoke to her, but somehow she had a measure of faith. Somehow she was able to. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, leaving out of the bottom. Oh, can't ever happen here. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. And a little oil, a little oil in a cruise, and I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for my son that we may eat it and die. I don't believe it was a sad song. I believe it was a true fact. She went beyond the present circumstances, the present reality. Verse 13. And Elijah said to her, Fear not! You're never going anywhere until you get the fear nots out. Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. He said, Out of what you got. Make me a little cake. He said, make me the whole whole rig here. He said, yes, make me a little. That woman had no idea what she was opening up in the world of the spirit that's far beyond any natural provision of mankind. And bring it to me and make for me, make for thee, make for me, make, bring it to me. After make for thee and for thy son, put God first. Verse 14. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, I'd rather have that than Fox News. I'd rather have that than the best financial mind. I'd rather have that than the best lawyer. The barrel of meal shall not waste, and neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day. Here's a prophetic promise. Here's a prophetic promise. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. This message is all about hold on, hold on, hold on. I want you to understand that God takes delights in taking so little and making so much of it. Do you remember the woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 who was married to the, one of the sons of the prophets? She died. She died. Not she didn't die. He died and left her with a terrible indebtedness, and they were going to come and indenture her sons. He said, what have you got where? 
I want to know what you got in your hand. I want to know what you got in your house. Because it's one of those two places. Or what have you got in your heart? What have you got in your mind? God wants to use that. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. More frequently, far more frequently that I can remember, I'm hearing, I'm ready to go home. I'm hearing, this world does not satisfy me. I'm hearing, I'm ready. I'm ready. Be you also ready. God can take a little and make so much out of it. A little girl in Philadelphia saved her pennies. She heard in children's school that they were going to build a new church and big places for children to play and receive ministry. She came from a very poor situation, but she saved up, I think it was about $16. She put it in a little bag and wrapped it up and put it on the church steps with a little note. And she was killed in an accident. All she wanted to do was build a church so kids could come. The pastor got up a few days later at a funeral. Held that bag for that change in it. I read that note, and they started coming from everywhere. And they said, We want to give to that little girl's offering. Needless to say, the church was built. What would you withhold from God? What would you withhold from God? Oh, preacher, that's an unfair question. I asked you then, what would God withhold from you? Not even His only Son. Stand with me, would you please? Oh, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Woo! Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something, how many of you know what it is? There's something about that name. Lift up your hands and say that name that we love, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I've heard the name of tyrants. I've heard the name of kings. I've heard the name of the fabulously wealthy and powerful. 
but I've never heard a name so wonderful as his name. His name shall be called wonderful. Hallelujah. Breathe in this house, O Lord. Thank you for the patience of this people. Listen so intently and so. Thank you, Baptist. Right where you are, will you pray about he is? I have people I love. They miss or leave him. Name of Jesus. Soak this people under the anointing. Soak this people under your anointing. Soak this people. Team. I pray for protection. I pray for covering. Lord, I lift up to you tonight those on our prayer list. Those with cancer, heal them. I lift up those with physical needs. I lift up Katie to you. I lift up others who are battling COVID and its effects, its ravaging. I pray, God, for the prayer requests, the unspoken ones, the multitude of requests that come to us daily. I lift them all up, Lord. You know every name, every situation. Father, I pray for a Tara and for Carrie. I pray for Jamie. I pray for missionaries in the Middle East and around the world. I pray for the unspoken request. I pray for cancer, illness, addictions, grief, life's challenges. I pray for our nation and leadership. I pray for the nation of Israel. I pray for the body of Christ to awaken. And my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Father, we pray for those who listen to us live stream. In the name of Jesus. Now I pray for those with other needs, God, other sicknesses, infirmities. In the name of Jesus, you'll pull them up for me, please. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray for Miss Irene's daughter. God, let the Holy Ghost come over her. God, for Joyce, for Mary Wileen, for David Fulmer, for Mark Zielinski, for Faith Green, for Jeannie Bosvert, for Cora Phipps, for Bertie Fireborn, for Mary Hartland, Hartley, for Jeff Jackson, for Terry Grant. Would you pray especially for Terry? God, he needs a miracle. He needs a miracle. God, for Jerry's continued healing, for Katie Bass, for Dean Lewis. God, I pray for Jerry Phillips and Mark Totten, Cameron Williams, Cora Hain, Dar Donna Haney, Pam Dysalega, Eunice Small, James Long, Johnny Engel, Jimmy Singletary, John, Sammy Leonard, Yvette Thompson, Liz Tangeman. God, I pray for Miss Irene and Pearl's families. I pray for the Elwood Smith family. I pray for the Brooks family. I pray for Daryl's wife, Sandy. I pray for Harvest Time Assembly. I pray for Danielle. I pray for her family. And God and others we may have missed or forgotten. Not intentionally, Lord, but we pray for all. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. Pray as you go out the door. Pray as you drive home. Pray as you go to bed. Pray as you wake up. Pray, pray, pray. God bless you.